I saw a documentary about American boxing many, many years ago. I probably saw the documentary 20 years ago, and probably the film was made 10 years before that. So my apologies to the American Boxing League. The information I'm going to share with you now is probably way out of date. But in that documentary, the filmmaker asked someone, asked an expert, what is the evidence that boxing in the United States of America is corrupt? That the, uh, the league standings, so to speak, are controlled by corrupt mafia and business concerns and what have you, that they're established through bribery. And he said, well, here, I'll show you what the league standings are according to the different authorities. Um, ultimately, these authorities are linked to different belts and titles. And he said, the top 10 list for who's the best boxer and who's the worst, they have no resemblance to one another in these, these different league standings because they're all based on these corrupt criteria. And the guy argued, look, um, if there were any legitimacy to this boxing league system at all, maybe there'd be a 10% difference between one version of uh, the top 10 and another. Maybe there'd be a 20% difference. But you couldn't possibly have this kind of total day and night difference uh, between the evaluation of who's winning and who's losing in the world of boxing. This, this inconsistency is itself a really powerful sign that something is wrong here. Something is corrupt. So in the same way, I just want to start by uh, stating the total difference in the methods being advanced for language learning, uh, both in you know, formal university institutional settings and by language coaches, experts, and gurus here on YouTube, that is already a hint that there is something very fundamentally wrong with this world of for-profit language teaching. I have some other red flags about Lao Shu in particular. Uh, English is his first language, and yet I notice his command of the English language itself is remarkably poor. Here he says, if you were a woman, I would be in love with you, close quote. So this is women as apparently a spelling error for woman. That's not the sort of error most English speakers make in their own first language. Here's another title he typed out. Somali man shocked by black American in convenient store. Uh, uh, right. Convenient store, not convenience store. This, this appeared as an intentionally made misspelling in a, in a Canadian comedy show, a famous comedy TV show called Trailer Park Boys. Two of these kind of uh, high school dropouts opened a convenience store, and they, they both spelled it and pronounced it in this way. Again, the, the reason why that's a funny joke is because it's an error a native speaker of English would never make. As someone who has ostensibly, if not actually, devoted his life to language learning and language teaching, there seems to be a lot wrong with Lao Shu, even looking at his first language. So now I'm going to quote for you an opinion uh, from Reddit. I'll give you the source at the end of this quotation. I did not write this myself. And I actually don't agree with this criticism 100%, but I think, again, it raises serious salient questions. Quote, I just Googled the FLR method, and when I finally found a page that wasn't trying to sell me stuff, I wasn't sure if I should have been disappointed in the method for being even lower than my low expectation. From what I can gather, the goal of the method is not to learn languages. The goal of the method is to memorize stock phrases, mainly questions and answers, as a whole package, meaning you aren't actually learning words and grammar, you are memorizing a fixed and extremely limited amount of strings of sounds off of which you run an algorithm. Question A requires answers A1 plus A2, after that ask question B. This isn't being conversational, this is being a recording. Right. He's making an interesting point here. Even deeper, there's the concern that in your first three months, first six months studying a language, if you memorize these long strings, if you do phrase book methodology like this and you just drill saying whole phrases, you're not learning the smaller components that make up words. So in some languages, what you need to learn are morphemes. In some languages, you need to learn something like a, a stem or a root. In some languages, you need to learn an, infimi an infinitive form of a verb and then how that relates to the particular use of the verb. Um, it's not as simple as saying morphemes 
as opposed to whole words. Because if we're generalizing here about all languages in the world, I mean, Chinese, there are even graphical components of the word that aren't pronounced. We have to learn visually what makes up the symbol that expresses the word apart from uh, the sound and what have you. On the other hand, of course, Chinese doesn't have uh, gender, um, doesn't even have singular versus plural or you know, past tense or what have you. But nevertheless, so, you know, th there are actually components within the words you should be learning from day one. And if you don't learn them, then later you have to unlearn the bad habits you've gotten into by learning whole phrases. And uh, sometimes there are, shall we say, aspects of the word that are external to the morphemes. Like they're not within the word written there, whether that's learning something like an infinitive or gender. There's a lot of this other kind of apparatus of language that if you don't learn it in your first six months, you're later going to be struggling against the bad habits you've learned, the bad things you've learned. Okay, so uh, just to finish this quotation, learning phrases per se is not a bad thing, especially in the beginning, but then claiming that just because you can replay a bunch of fixed sounds in fixed combinations means you are quote-unquote conversational is nothing but base charlatanry. So that condemnation was uh, certainly harsh and not at all half-hearted or halfway. So I now think, to be fair, I have to play uh, Lao Shu's own pitch for his method. Let's hear that out. And you'll notice that he is not recommending this as a self-evident and adequate way to learn a language forever and ever. He is talking about the first six months, and his main claim is that his method will help you to remain highly motivated and get results within those first six months, and then you transition to more of an analytical and grammatical approach to the language. I start in a natural way, and then I spend six months doing a natural way. After six months, then I start getting some grammar stuff and start getting a, trying to understand grammar concepts, you know. At, after six months, then it wouldn't affect me as it would if I was just starting a language as a complete beginner. But if you look at level one, it's all phrases and keywords. Every week, there, it switches up. A different keyword, phrase, different. That's like three months worth of material right there that I just explained to you and just described. That's how I set that up. Now, like I said, that's not all. If you want to go further, there's more material that you have to learn, you know, to increase your vocabulary, you know, and that's what I do. You know, it's not all about just learning questions and answer stuff. It's more to it. And if you go through all the levels, you will see the progression. It's a huge progression from level one going all the way up. But the question is, are you willing to put that time in and put that effort in? Are you are you willing to put that work in to learn all that stuff? So let's contrast this to the world of diet and exercise. Okay, It may seem like there are very fundamental differences between what different diet gurus tell you to do in the first six months or different gym coaches tell you to do in the first six months. But you know what? With the exception of a few insane crackpots, all of them are based on counting the number of calories, counting the number of grams of protein, counting the number of grams of fat, lifting weight, progressively heavier weight. There are broad outlines here that are very fundamentally similar with different coaches for health and weight loss. We could definitely draw out the scientific outlines of what almost all diet and exercise advice have, has in common. And what we find with language learning is that there is no such common ground. If you contrast uh, Luca Lamparello, sorry for mispronouncing your name, and Lao Shu here, if you contrast the various leading competing for-profit gurus, what they recommend in terms of language learning protocol, language learning methodology, they're fundamentally and profoundly different from one another. And the world of university teaching, the methods used there in the classroom, is profoundly different again. So something's wrong here. There's something worth examining. There's something worth reflecting on. Now, I'm not gonna end this video to just leave you wondering what, what's the solution to the riddle? <laughs> no, I'm going to destroy the mystery right here and now, and it's twofold. One, outcome evaluation. What none of these people are doing is evaluating outcomes, right? If we really wanted to know which method was more effective, efficient, which had better outcomes, we'd have to measure the input and the output. 
we'd have to actually keep track of how many students from Lao Shu's program achieved what level in how much time, with how much effort, with how much money, right? And I have sat in classrooms face-to-face -face with the university dean, the head of the department, and the head language teacher pushing universities on that issue. Why is it that you're not evaluating how much Chinese these students actually learn when they spend like $20,000 in four years to learn Chinese from you and the outcomes are they can barely put a sentence together unless, you know, the professor is cheating. Because in that same meeting where I met with the professor and the head of the department stuff, they were like, oh, but this girl Mimi can speak Chinese so well. That's because Mimi's mom is Chinese. She grew up speaking Chinese in her living room and singing Chinese karaoke. It doesn't count. You can't use students who came into the program already, you know, halfway fluent or growing up with the language of their family. But they, they really did reach that kind of thing where it's like, look, you know, I notice you guys are not measuring outcomes. You're not measuring the actual degree of ability that you achieve by using terrible methods, like having 40 students sit in a classroom, listen to an audio CD that the professor presses play on, and then doing a multiple, multiple choice checklist style test in class every day. Gee, remarkably, after four years and $20,000, it seems like those students speak way less Chinese than I managed to learn in seven months living in Kunming, China, using really intensive methods that I'm not going to now describe by contrast, right? So outcome evaluation, measuring the outcomes would be crucial to backing up the claim that Lao Shu's method is more effective than Luca's method, or that Luca's method is more effective than university methods, or that one university's methods are more effective than another, so on and so forth. And just like diet and exercise, the way that uh, gurus, for-profit language courses, get around this fundamental problem is by putting the emphasis almost entirely on the magical and difficult to measure world of motivation. Right? <laughs> so uh, I may not be able to prove to you that my clients, as a trainer at the gym, uh, can now lift 200 pounds, and before they could only lift 150 pounds, or that they lost weight, you know, they, they used to weigh 300 pounds, and now they only weigh 200 pounds. Those would be objective measures of outcomes, right? But what I can talk about, what I can package and sell you infinitely in many different forms with no limit is this concept of motivation. Because what really matters for your personal fitness, for your weight loss journey, for gaining strength in the gym, is what motivates you. And what you gotta pay me for, and why you gotta buy my book and watch my videos is motivation, motivation, motivation. And what I see here online, and I mean, it's not a complete scam. There is something to it, is that people are asking you to pay them money, not for them to teach you the language, but really for them to give you a bunch of pep talks that boil down to motivation and the faith that people have that if only they were highly motivated enough, they could climb any mountain, they could learn any language. And I hate to tell you this, guys, if you go back to outcome evaluation, that is just not true. If you're the most highly motivated, hardworking person in the world, but you're using bad methods, you get bad results. At the gym, you get injured, you get weaker instead of stronger, you get fatter instead of thinner, right? In language learning, trust me, trust me. <laughs> I've met people who lived in Thailand and spoke the Thai language every day for 10 years and still never picked up the rudiments of how to put a sentence together. They didn't know which words were the verb and which was the noun and which was the adjective in the sentence. In a monosyllabic language like Thai, you can you cannot know those things. They didn't know when something was the suffix of one word or the prefix of the next word. They really profoundly had misapprehended things in the language and those, those bad habits they picked up by starting off with phrase book knowledge, rote memorization, repeating dialogues, the same way Lao Shu endorses. Those became, you know, deep-seated, inculcated habits of mind that they never did overcome. In language learning, there really is the equivalent of destroying your health at the gym and of getting weaker when you're working hard thinking you're getting stronger.